It is a June afternoon, 300 years before Christ. The young Greek who conquered the world faces his last battle. Only the prayers of his men can help Alexander now. This is the historic amphitheater at Igira in Greece. Imagine the scene. 320 years before the birth of Christ. Every seat on these terraces will be filled. There's a buzz of anticipation in the theater as the audience waits for the play to begin. And somewhere, very likely, there'll be several elderly men who've lived through a, an experience which would make any play dull by comparison. They're the veterans of the army of Alexander the Great, who've returned home from the ends of the world, having played their part in one of the greatest adventure stories in history. They'll probably be in um, some special seats because they're treated as heroes, having known the man who was worshipped by many as a god. Alexander of Macedon. He was born in the north of Greece, in Macedonia, where his father was the king and his mother the queen. By the time he was 32, he was dead. But in those few short years, he had changed the course of history. The life of this man is one of our civilization's greatest stories. What he accomplished then still has relevance to the way we live our lives today. His life certainly changed those who knew him. 
Same age as me. <laughs> A bit more life in him, though. <laughs> They were remarkable characters, all of them. Some feared Alexander and their fear became hate. Others understood the man, even loved him. Many laid down their lives for the causes he pursued. They all played their parts in one of the greatest adventures in history. The time wasn't right. His father was Philip II, King of Macedonia, a tough and experienced man. Few stood in his way for long. He turned his small kingdom into a force to be reckoned with. His mother, Olympias, a woman of strange passions. All her life she denied that Philip was the father of her child. Hephaestion, Alexander's closest and most trusted friend. And the one they called Ptolemy. He survived them all and became pharaoh of Egypt. Their enemy, the enemy of all the Greeks, was Darius, who ruled the mighty Persian Empire. Who had showed the slightest a strategic or a, a tactical grasp. Demosthenes, the Athenian. He was no friend of Alexander's either. And all the others from that age so long ago. Aristotle, the philosopher, he was Alexander's teacher. Then the reverence they had Clytus, the Greek general. Not Alexander say. killed him in rage. Yes, but the Persians. These were the people who knew Alexander. They're all here now because only they can tell us what really happened when Alexander the Great ruled the world. from the great Zeus himself, I worship Dionysus, the god of ecstasy. He never failed to reward my faith. Ah, to your own discredit. I always thought you resented the fact that Dionysus honored me more than you ever could yourself. <laughs> Displays the narrowness of your mind. I don't know how I could have married such a coarse man. <coughs> you had no choice. That was up to your brother, the so-called king of Epirus. And you were as eager as any other hunting bitch to share in the glorious crown of Macedon. You wanted me. I married you as my royal duty. My gift, the gift of the God, is ecstasy. How do you learn of this? In the service of the God. Who taught you? Other servants of the God. Did you yourself 
experience this ecstasy. Describe it. It cannot be described. It can only be recreated. Resurrected. Resurrected, then? I cannot do so by myself. Through me? Only if the God will work through you. Will he? He might. There are many stories surrounding the birth of Alexander. Philip? King Philip? It was the great god Zeus who appeared before me. In that instant, I conceived a son. And his father was king of the gods. He was, they said, a bright and alert child. The world into which Alexander was born looked like this. And the land of Greece was made up of uh, a collection of independent states. Here was Athens, down towards the south, and up here in the north, Macedonia, where Philip ruled. Uh, it is a wet and mountainous country, populated mostly by shepherds and guarded, of course, by Philip's army. Their enemy, and the common enemy of all the city-states, was here in the east, Persia. There was a soothsayer. Can't remember his name, doesn't matter. What does matter? that on the day Alexander was born, he predicted that a son born to me on that day would be invincible. Invincible. <laughs> Bold prediction. I didn't predict the games. My horse came in first that day, way ahead of the others. Didn't predict that. <laughs> invincible, he said. He was right in what was of any importance. I had a plan. No, more. A dream. To take over and unite the city-states. With the unity of the Greek states, we would have strength. And then we would liberate the Greek cities in Asia from Persian rule. You didn't achieve it, though. Perhaps you should have discarded the dream and just stuck to the plan. Inconsequential things, dreams. I needed secure borders and strong allies. I needed the sea power of Athens. And I needed an army that was trained to conquer. And I needed time. It wasn't always on my side. I lost my eye. Not with Tony. Everyone thought I was dying, except you, Athenian. You didn't, did you, Demosthenes? I have never believed that events are so easily resolved. 
With that, I agree. You needed time. All that time, Alexander and I, we hardly ever saw you. Oh, woman, there was always a campaign, a conference, a treaty, endless battles. And with each, you took a new mistress. Common practice. A requirement of strategy, madam. At the heart of that strategy was a unified Greece, and Philip was ready to go to war to achieve it. We march south. First Greece, then Persia. And of Greece, first Athens, and of Athens, first Demosthenes. Hundreds of miles to the south, Demosthenes, the politician and orator, was waging his war of words in the marketplace of Athens. Have you watched Philip's rise to power? First he seizes Amphipolis, then Pydna and Potidaea. After that comes Methone's turn. Then Thessaly. Thrace, a short rest. He is sick, he has lost an eye, they say. Athens, rest easy. But meanwhile, back at the royal palace, a boy is being raised. He is called Alexander. At the age of seven years old, this innocent child interrogates the envoys from the king of Persia. Does he ask them about camels? Or the hanging gardens of Babylon? No. He asks them, what is the size of your army? How fast can your cavalry move? How long are your spears? Do you carry war machines? I tell you, men of Athens, another Philip is being raised. Watch this one. Watch him carefully. time he was taken away from his mother. She fills his head with woman's nonsense. He must learn to live in a man's world with the gods of men, not the gods of that pampered female. The god of war, not the god of wine. I want a civilized boy. And I want a tough one. Philip chose Leonidas an uncle of the Queen. He could be trusted and knew what to do and how to do it. The boy was given food only if he earned it. He was permitted a thin tunic and no blankets. Long marches, exhausting exercise, physical discomfort. That was Alexander's life from now on. Stop! Survive against all odds. Become physically and mentally tougher than your opponent. Month after month, the lessons were drilled into the young Alexander. Leonidas did his job thoroughly. Alexander, how delightful of you to honor me when I was feeling so alone. So, do you hate us for what you're made to endure? It is not my choice. I would have joyousness in your days, you know that. Do not blame me. It is Philip's command. 
He insists that it will make you strong. He seems not to realize that you are already strong. I prepared him well. For what? Alexander was a loving, gentle child until you took him from me. We don't expect you to understand that. Understand what? That you tried to turn a child against the woman who bore him? It is you who could never understand. Alexander wasn't like other children. From the very instant he was conceived, he didn't need your training to make him different. At five, he drew a bow with skill. At seven, he could play the lyre and recite poetry to everyone's delight. But you weren't satisfied with that. You took him away and made him pinched and pale and so deeply withdrawn into himself that even tears were beyond his reach. Recited poetry at seven. What man or state ever survived by reciting poetry? And what prince of Macedon ever defended himself against a thousand lances by playing music on the lyre? You have no appreciation of reality, madam. But Alexander did. He was an apt pupil. What you have never understood is that Alexander's destiny was already assured because he was a son of a god. So you always insist. And to my embarrassment, when it's known that in Athens they make laughter about offspring who are left in doubt as to who their father is. There was never any doubt as to who his father was. Alexander had no need of you to interfere with his education. He was the son of Zeus. On the contrary, my lady. Even the sons of gods must learn the accomplishments and limitations of men. The divine essence is so volatile needs human discipline to contain it. You'll be telling me next that Zeus himself must be instructed and disciplined by men. No, 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 no. I cannot, my lady, because Zeus is wholly divine. But your son walked on earth beside us and was therefore half mortal. Hence the problem to reconcile the divine essence with mortality, the, the fleshy substance. I don't think you can make fun of me with your cleverness. Well, of course he can, because you're a stupid and pretentious woman. There is no doubt, my lady, that your early education and upbringing of Alexander didn't go unnoticed, at least by me. But the other education I received with him under Leonidas served him equally well. I believe both were at work when you sent for that war horse friend. Anyone could see at first glance the horse was completely wild. Away. You'll kill anyone who tries to ride him. My father is losing a great force because he doesn't know how to handle him. All right, my young friend. Let's see you up there. If you can ride him, I'll buy him for you. <laughs> the young fool's got on him. Take him back.
and keep his head towards the sun. He is afraid of his own shadow. I do believe, Prince Alexander, that Macedonia may be too small for you. As a term of affection, Alexander called his horse Bucephalus, which means ox head. And he rode him into battle until the heroic animal was 28 years old. Spartan training and methods had produced a very remarkable young man who was well equipped to look after himself, but his education was by no means complete. And Philip, that tough and uh, redoubtable campaigner, made what was for him a very interesting decision. Aristotle? There were many men by that name. When you were... Uh, when you tell me which one it is you want, or why you want him, I may be able to answer you. The philosopher. All men are philosophers. Most of them bad ones. Sit down. Have some wine. No. Thank you. Not too long ago, I destroyed the town from where Aristotle the philosopher came. I offer to rebuild that town for its people and pay the philosopher handsomely into the bargain. In return for what? For his teaching. You, uh... You know of my teaching? No. Nope. Your reputation. Oh. My reputation seems to have traveled far, by heads, if not by distance. Will you teach, philosopher? Uh, I'm afraid, with the reputation of your own, <clears throat> maybe too late. Your mind may have atrophied. It's not me I'm asking you to teach. It's my son, Alexander. What will you teach? Politics, metaphysics, ethics, music and medicine, astronomy, magnets and optics, poetics, man's nature, zoology, embryology, philosophy and logic. Oh, and I like bees. <laughs> guarded, of course, by Philip's army. Their enemy and the common enemy of all the city-states was here in the east. Persia. Not at all. I simply bided by my own philosophy, for there are three things a wise man should do. Fall in love, take part in politics, and live with a king. <laughs> well, you taught him. That's what I wanted. Yes. Alexander was bright and quick. A pupil of the most unusual caliber, whether mortal or divine. No one really knows what Alexander was taught. We know that Aristotle himself was trained in astronomy, botany, biology. His father had been a physician, so he probably trained the boy in the art of medicine as well because we know that on occasion, Alexander tended his wounded troops. Together with the young prince, Aristotle also taught the class of youngsters who would one day become the Macedonian elite. On that gentleman is how it's done. And now we come to the uh, 
They grew from boys into men under the influence of their brilliant teacher. What are the qualities which make a king? Answers, please, gentlemen. Courage. Yes, I thought you might say that. Courage, certainly, Ptolemy. But never rashness. Any other... Contributions? <laughs> ah! <laughs> Authority. Yes. Authority. Uh, but uh, authority tempered by justice, and justice in turn tempered by... Mercy. Mm. Loyalty. Yes, but not blind royalty in feasting. Liberality. Well said, Alexander. Liberality indeed, my prince. But uh, which we must not confuse with extravagance. The true prince is never st stingy and never prodigal. Would you say my father is a good example of the adage? Your father must proceed according to the nature and amount of his assets. Which he alternately hoards and squanders. Is that liberality? Your father saves his assets against his needs and spends them when he must to meet those needs. When he conquers Persia, he will have far greater resources and we may, all of us, expect a more man... He was born in the north of Greece, in Macedonia, where his father was the king and his mother the queen. By the time he was 32, he was dead. But in those few short years, he had changed the course of history. The life of this man is one of our civilization's greatest stories. What he accomplished then still has relevance to the way we live our lives today. His life certainly changed those who knew him. Same age as me. <laughs> Bit more life in him, though. <laughs> they were remarkable characters, all of them. Some feared Alexander, and their fear became hate. Others understood the man, even loved him. Many laid down their lives for the causes he pursued. They all played their parts in one of the greatest adventures in history. The time wasn't right. His father was Philip II, King of Macedonia, a tough and experienced man. Few stood in his way for long. He turned his small kingdom into a force to be reckoned with. His mother, Olympias, a woman of strange passions. All her life she denied that Philip was the father of her child. Hephaestion, Alexander's closest and most trusted friend. And the one they called Ptolemy. He survived them all and became pharaoh of Egypt. Their enemy, the enemy of all the Greeks, was Darius, who ruled the mighty Persian Empire. You had showed the slightest uh, strategic or uh, a tactical grasp. Demosthenes, the Athenian. He was no friend of Alexander's either. And all the others from that age so long ago. Aristotle, the philosopher, he was Alexander's teacher. Then the reverence they had. Clytus, the Greek general. Alexander say. killed him in rage. Yes, but the Persians. These were the people who knew Alexander. They're all here now because only they can tell us what really happened when Alexander the Great ruled the world.
from the great Zeus himself, I worship Dionysus, the god of ecstasy. He never failed to reward my faith. Ah, to your own discredit. I always thought you resented the fact that Dionysus honored me more than you ever could yourself. <laughs> Displays the narrowness of your mind. I don't know how I could have married such a coarse man. <coughs> you had no choice. That was up to your brother, the so-called King of Epirus. And you were as eager as any other hunting bitch to share in the glorious crown of Macedon. You wanted me. I married you as my royal duty. <laughs> My gift, the gift of the god, is ecstasy. How do you learn of this? In the service of the god. Who taught you? Other servants of the god. Did you yourself experience this ecstasy? Describe it. It cannot be described. It can only be recreated. Resurrected. Resurrected, then? I cannot do so by myself. Through me. Only if the God will work through you. Will he? He might. There are many stories surrounding the birth of Alexander. A moment in Philip's career because it was there that the newly formed League of Greek city-states had gathered. And after his recent uh, military triumph at Charonia, they elected him as supreme commander of all Greek armies. 
Now, this was a substantial step ahead. There was the personal glory, of course, but far more important than that, he now would have the chance to go down in history as the liberator of all the occupied Greek cities on the coast of Asia. You know I had to return to Macedonia. There were other things to be done. Affairs of state. And then there was you. What were you up to while I was away, I wonder? What would a scheming, excessive lady do while her king was away warring? Away whoring? Ta! For each campaign, you took another mistress! And their names were on the lips of every Greek. You insulted me. You denigrated my religion, my friendships. You tried to usurp my son! And as queen, I was expected to maintain my superior position over all these other women. I would have needed my own army behind me to keep them all in their place. <laughs> Your own army? I'd like to have seen that. Philip and his son facing an army of women. But he was not your son. And that too was on the lips of every Greek. While I was away, you intrigued for power. Were you afraid of me? You schemed for power for yourself, and you lusted after my throne for your so-called son of Zeus. So afraid that you returned to your kingdom to take a new young wife. The niece of Attalus. You thought you'd produce an heir to the throne by her and cast out my son. Were you that afraid of Alexander too? Speak honestly. Speak so that everyone can hear. <laughs> yeah. Now, let Olympia scheme. I'll have another son without the name of Zeus this time. May the gods grant that this union between Philip and my niece will at last provide us with a legitimate heir to the throne of Macedon. You black drunken pig. So I am not a legitimate heir. <laughs> <laughs> Just look at this gentleman, my father, Philip of Macedon, who says he will cross the seas to defeat the Persians when he can't even cross the floor from one couch to another. Mm. Be wrong. Don't be anxious. Does Philip threaten me with his new bride? Not yet. Collect your treasures. I will not have you stay in this house. The house of a drunken fornicator. Collect your treasures. If he accuses me of intrigue, it's because he's afraid of you. He sees in you the king he could never be. Well, he may be rid of me, but never you, my lord. Never.
One of Philip's oldest friends patched up the quarrel between father and son, and Alexander was persuaded to return home. But his mother stayed with her brother, the king of Epirus. <laughs> uh, Philip had one other son beside Alexander, who was the result of a liaison with a girl from Thessaly. And according to some authorities, the boy was a halfwit. But be that as it may, one day around this time, Philip received a message from a high-ranking Persian Greek offering a, a daughter in marriage. So Philip decided that he'd marry off his allegedly half-witted son. For one thing, that would give him an excellent foothold on the Asiatic side of the Aegean Sea from which to launch his great crusade against Persia when the time came. You and your group of actors are touring from Pergamus to Ephesus. You can be of service to me. When you reach Smyrna, go to Mr. Farmies and say, I, the true son of Achilles, will not yield your daughter to my brother, who is nothing. And then say... So, it's games of conspiracy. The secret messengers now, is it? Interfering with my plans. Take him, cut out his tongue. It's no game of mine. It's yours. You offered my half-wit brother in marriage in preference to myself in order to dishonor and discredit me. I'll have no more from you. If you cut out all the tongues in Greece, you could not conceal the truth. Your design is to lessen my name as far as Asia in order that it is not feared by the barbarians before the name of Philip. Enough. That marriage was rightly mine. If it is a challenge you seek, make it openly. If you're not all 50 miles away from here by dusk, I'll have the guards cut out your livers by the following sunrise, and that includes you, oh true son of Achilles. Exile. All because of a marriage to a barbarian from some unknown part of Asia. Yeah, but can we go back? Women. They're not worth the trouble, you know. It means to an end. But will he have us back? We'll do better than that. Watch your class. What's that Achilles? And what do you two heroes have in mind? Well, he won't let me marry a Persian satrap's daughter. It means he has plans for me. He'll take me back. And what about us? You as well. But it's not us I'm worried about. What do you mean? It's my mother, Olympias. What plans does he have for her? Olympias, still in Epirus, prayed to the gods and waited. It was no secret that Philip had decided to get rid of her, but at the same time he wanted to avoid a rift with her family. His way of sidestepping trouble was to marry off their daughter to the king of Epirus. In other words, Olympias' own daughter would marry her own brother. It was Philip's way of showing that he had nothing against his in-laws, even if he was fed up with his wife. said the celebrations will be spectacular. Games and prizes for poetry, contests for drama, 
the sacrificial procession of the thirteen gods. Thirteen? You mean twelve? Thirteen, my lady. You mean he's at last decided to give Alexander the recognition he deserves? No, my lady. It is the statue of Philip that is to be carried with the other twelve. Philip? Philip? You tell me at one stroke that I am discarded. My brother pacified. Philip honored as a god. While the true god Alexander is denigrated even further. May Zeus strike him down. On the morning of my daughter's wedding, my slaves dressed me in my finest. Kings, ambassadors, envoys from all over the known world all brought splendid gifts. And they were seated in the theater waiting for the sacrificial procession to arrive. Statues of the gods, all 13 of them, preceded me as I made my way from the palace to the theater. When I got to the gates of the theater, I glimpsed the crowds inside. A captain of my guard was standing at attention near the Parados his eyes staring straight ahead of him. I passed him on my blind side. The side where I lost my eye, Methony. And as I did so, I remembered he usually stood on my good side. I was very pleased with the arrangements for my daughters, but... There was a rumor, and there are many people who still believe it today, that on the night of the assassination, Olympias returned to Macedonia and placed a golden crown on the head of her husband's murderer, because he'd already been crucified instantly. And later it's said she secretly buried the murderer on top of her husband as a sign of contempt, but uh, nobody really knows. When Alexander was seven years old, his father ordered that he should be removed from his mother's care. He wanted the child trained in a tougher place than home. Olympias never forgave her husband. Spartan training produced results. Before he was much older, the child had been taught how to kill with his bare hands. There was another side to his education. His father hired one of the greatest philosophers who ever lived to teach the boy. 
Aristotle. On that gentleman is how it's done. Alexander grew up under the influence of this great question. teacher, and the intelligent young prince was quick to learn. What Aristotle couldn't teach him, his father did. The tactics and conduct of war. Keep the pressure to the center and press hard. Hammer blows to the flanks for the cavalry. Lances with blades as sharp as Aristotle's scalpels to cut through the enemy lines. Perfect drill, perfect wheeling, and speed, my son. Discipline and speed. <laughs> Your design is to lessen my name... But father and son had their own personal battles when the young prince me. attempted to defy his monarch. If it is a challenge you seek, make it openly. If you're not all 50 miles away from here by dusk, I'll have the guards cut out your livers by the following sunrise. And that includes you, O oh, true son of Achilles. Alexander's father was killed by an assassin. Some people believe that his wife was behind the murder, but even to this day, no one is sure. While the blood-stained body of uh, Alexander's father, Philip II, was still lying in the theater at Agai, his favorite general, Antipater, was making ready to present the 20-year-old Alexander as the rightful heir to the throne. There were other pretenders, Alexander's cousin, Amyntas, could have made a claim, being a pure Macedonian. He was killed instantly. Two others, princes of Lincestis, were also cut down. According to Macedonian custom, the new ruler had to be elected by the army. They had no hesitation in voting for Alexander. No sooner was he crowned than some of the Greek city-states in the south challenged the authority of the new young king. It was a critical time for Alexander, the first real test of all his training. He moved his Macedonian army south. Speed and surprise were the tactics. He found the route was barred by impassable mountains, but he was not going to be beaten so early in the game. He ordered steps to be carved in the rock face so that they could get across. Troops, horses, equipment, all the paraphernalia of an army at war were hauled over the mountain because Alexander wanted to get behind the enemy lines. It was an incredible achievement. Like his father before him, he would allow nothing to stand in his way.
when Alexander was born, it said that his mother believed that the great god Zeus was the father of her child. Now, in the 20th century, <clears throat> it's rather hard to understand these things or take them seriously, but 300 years before Christ, people were less disparaging. They believed that men could be gods or that gods could sire men. And so, to many in those days, Alexander was a god. He was elected by the League of City-States as Hegemon, or supreme commander of the Pan-Hellenic War against the Kingdom of Persia, and it was appropriate that Alexander of Macedon should be their choice because his father, King Philip II, before he died, had been planning to revenge all the past defeats that the Greeks had suffered at the hands of the Persians. So now Alexander was to inherit this responsibility. Darius, the king of Persia, ruled the largest and most powerful empire in the world. To an outsider, the Persian court would have seemed like a labyrinth of rules and social customs, meaningless in their complexity. Darius was not only a king, his people were taught that he was a god and had to be treated as such. His spies had reported to him, so his army knew about the Greek plans. They were not concerned. They were well able to deal with intruders. Darius knew that he was invincible. In the spring of 334 BC, Alexander set out at the head of the most powerful army ever assembled against an enemy of Greece. Their objective, a landing near Troy on the coast of Asia. As the crow flies, it was not very far. But the sea crossing worried Alexander's generals. If they were intercepted, the entire Greek army might be wiped out by the Persian fleet. You will not attack us from the sea. Our scarcity is our shield. You find comfort in riddles, Alexander. I confess I cannot. Well, it's not a riddle. It's a military fact. Yes, but is it not also a fact that Darius has several advisors to warn him? Many of them Greek. Mercenaries who fight for money. Who would trust them? Darius believes he is unconquerable, invincible. For now, that is our greatest weapon. He will not attack us by sea. I will swear by all the gods, this victory will be ours, and Greece will be avenged. Alexander, the young Achilles, was ready for what he had been trained to do. Many of the Greeks already believed they were being led by a reincarnation of the Achilles of Greek legend. The noble Alexander behaved towards all Greeks as one would expect of him. Towards them, he was the leader. Towards all barbarians, he was the master. When great leaders take risks, they take them boldly. Yes. But you have to admit, Antipater, that what the Macedonians were saying was right. From the instant he appointed you regent and left on campaign, you became insufferably arrogant. Madam. He should have let me rule Macedonia. That would have been the sensible thing to do. After all, I had his trust. He kept the Iliad under his pillow as he slept. He was a great admirer of the poem's hero, Achilles. In fact, he regarded himself 
as Achilles reincarnation. Is that not so? So here was Alexander on the mainland of Asia. Soon his ships would be sent home, leaving Alexander and his army to face a formidable task. In 336 BC, the Persian Empire was enormous. It extended from the Aegean Sea in the west to the river Oxus on the east, and the north to where is now the Soviet Union, down into Egypt in the south. The center of government in Persia was Persepolis, and there were 20 provinces governed by what they called satraps. It was enormously powerful, and it could place, without any trouble, a quarter of a million men under arms to defend itself. So no wonder Darius, the king of Persia, felt safe and secure. Tell me, Bagos, what has been whispered in the tents of the satraps? The landing of the Macedonian Alexander at Troy is on their lips, my lord. I knew he was coming. I allowed him to enter. He marches. I know. And the further, the better. I will allow that too. And when he has come far enough, his army will be exhausted. And his supplies dwindling then. My Persian army will slay them. And, um... It open their empty Greek stomachs. <laughs> hmm. We are ready. Darius, with a single command, could muster hundreds of thousands of men to repel the Greeks. There was nothing to fear. We went to Troy, mainly because Alexander wanted to sacrifice at the tomb of Achilles. I laid a wreath at the tomb of Patroclus. Alexander used to call me Patroclus. I called him Achilles. Through me, his line went back to Achilles. Alexander sacrificed frequently to the gods. Through me, he knew their power. Well, you taught him well, my lady. From Troy, Alexander rejoined his forces, which by now had also crossed the Hellespont. Darius's generals were making preparations to deal with the young invader. They had chosen the battlefield, the river Granicus. There are conflicting accounts as to what happened, but um, of the result, there could be no doubt. The river Granicus. Persians on this side, Greeks on this side. Um, Alexander had advanced in battle formation with his infantry in two groups here and there. Both the wings were protected by cavalry and the heavy transport and baggage and camp followers and the rest were back there. The Persians faced them from the banks of this steep river. They were commanded by an odd assortment of men. There was Memnon, the mercenary general who was tough and experienced in battle, but most of the others were provincial governors and uh, relatives of Darius the king and could well have been appointed more by virtue of their social status than for their military skills, but they had a superb defensive position. Steep banks of the fast flowing and very deep Granicus. For Alexander, and all the signs of being an extremely difficult and very tough fight. The disadvantages are getting across and gaining those steep, slippery banks on the other side. But once there, the advantages will be ours. Our men are superior fighters, and our long spears are much better weapons than the light lances of the Persians. Each man knows his duty and will be prepared to die in order to ensure the victory. Our advance 
will lead through the centre. Parminium will command the left, and I will command the cavalry on the right. The Persians have offered a prize to any man who can kill you. If you must fear Ptolemy, don't fear for me. <laughs> Finally sounded that day. And we dedicated ourselves to the god of battle. The roar that went up was enough to rent the sky. Yes, we had trouble enough crossing the river. But as we climbed the banks, a barrage of missiles and volleys hailed down upon us. And the river ran red with blood. First I thought we were going to be thrown back. Then far on my right, a court set of white plumes on horseback, right on top of the bank. There was reason to fear for him. Two Persian commanders rode him down. Alexander struck one, but the other cleaved through his helmet and raised his axe for the death blow. Oh. Yes, he would have died had it not been for Clytus, brother of Alexander's nursemaid. He speared the Persian through. After that, there was no stopping Alexander. It is fiction, would you say? Fiction. There were no trumpets, no roar. And no sun. You weren't even there. At an hour when civilized armies rested and slept, Alexander's army crept across the Granicus like thieves in the night. And as silent as a lizard. That is how he gained the bank. <laughs> Such a weak excuse, even for a barbarian. Well said, Olympias. Perhaps you feel the truth is not worthy of your invincible hero, Hephaestion. Oh, I grant you that in battle Alexander showed courage and leadership, and he did win. But as to how he achieved victory at Granicus, a myth, all of it. Your tongue twists too far in search of envy, Demosthenes. It was a glorious victory. <laughs> The defeated Persians fled from the Granicus and made for the coast at Miletus. The victorious Greeks went south too, towards Sardis, and they were ready to fight for the town, but there was no need. Their advance guard was met by a Persian commander who surrendered at once. They passed through the streets of Sardis like liberators. Pursuit of the defeated enemy was the maxim, a tactic that spread fear before him like a flood clearing a passage. After Sardis, cities fell one after another like dominoes. About 60 miles south of Sardis, they came to the walls of Ephesus, and once more Alexander prepared to fight. But the Greeks within the city opened the gates for him and they entered without a struggle. It was here that Alexander began to show himself as something more than a military commander. The loyal Greeks in Ephesus saw their opportunity to revenge themselves on the Greek citizens who had supported the Persian regime. And these collaborators were hounded, pursued, dragged out of their beds and murdered. Alexander put a stop to that. There'd be no more bloodshed, he ordered, and for good measure, no more taxes, no more tributes. He established a democratic government to replace the Persian dictatorship. It was a diplomatic triumph to set beside his military conquests. Another 50 miles south, and they came to the city of Miletus. Alexander attacked, breached the walls, entered. There was no massacre. Looting was forbidden. Instead, he, he pardoned the citizens. He even pardoned the Greek mercenaries who defended the city against him. 
He never done that before. It was very good public relations. The legend of the beneficent conqueror was beginning to spread. They'd already come a long way in the city of Halifax. We were all worried. If Menman succeeded and the Persian fleet had been able to blockade the ports, we would have had to return to Greece to protect the mainland. Alexander wrote and told me of his concern. It was a dilemma. We were going to capture the Persian ports, so their fleet had nowhere to go. But the Persians under Menman were at sea on their way to blockade our ports and our trade route. God smiled on us. An oracle has foretold that whoever loosens the knot becomes lord of Asia. If I'm to be ruler of all Asia, I must loose the Gordian knot. It's the legend. Does the legend tell of any constriction? Not that I know of. As they moved forward, they had an extraordinary stroke of good luck. Well, lucky for them, Memnon died suddenly, and without him in command, the Persian blockade of Greece was doomed to failure, and Alexander could use some good luck. The long winter had taken its toll, and even he was close to exhaustion and became desperately ill. I think you should read this at once. You read to me. It's an interesting letter here, physician, from Parmenion. He tells me Darius has offered you a large sum of money to poison me. Here. Read. Mm. Well, is it safe to drink? Yes. Yes. I think so, too. Because if anything should happen to me, my army would tear you limb from limb. Of course, the medicine was not poisoned, but no one could have been absolutely sure, least of all Alexander. It was his somewhat hazardous method of showing that he trusted his men with his life. For some weeks, the Greeks had been trying to locate Darius and his army. Unknown to them, the Persians were doing the same thing, looking for the Greeks. They covered thousands of miles searching for each other, and at last they made contact. It was going to be a very important battle, and careful preparations were made on both sides. Alexander addressed his battle commanders. You are no strangers to danger. You have faced death many times before. The battle today will be against an enemy you have beaten before. They are Medes and Persians, men who for centuries have lived like children. But we have trained ourselves in hardship and danger and war, and they are no match for us. But most important, we are free men, and they are their master's slaves. Who among you, this day of days, would trust your life to a slave? To be sure you will meet Greeks, Greek mercenary traitors amongst the Persian ranks. Lepers who sell their lives for pay. But we, 
We fight for Greece. We struggle with love for our country in our hearts. We bow to no man. The victory today will be against Darius himself. The Persians have Darius. But you, you have Alexander! On or about the 1st of November in the year 333 BC, the two armies came face to face with each other at a place called Issus on the easternmost end of the Mediterranean. Alexander was vastly outnumbered by the Persians in a place which was geographically rather like this. On one side was the sea, on the other the curving foothills and the mountains beyond and directly in front of Alexander coming across, going down into the sea, was a river. Beyond that, Darius and his army. Down the center, there was a flat stretch of ground about a mile wide. Both armies could see each other quite clearly. Battle in those days was rather like a game of chess. You could see all the pieces on the board, but you still had to keep a sharp lookout. In this case, for instance, Darius tried to circle some troops round behind the mountains to hit Alexander's rear. Alexander blocked that. His problem, as far as he could see it, was going to be the river which was swollen from recent rains, which made the banks very slippery, bad fighting ground for his foot soldiers, so he decided to rely on cavalry and lead the charge himself. On a signal from Alexander, the cavalry broke into a gallop and headed straight for the river. Darius sent off his cavalry on both flanks at the same time. Alexander's men collided with the oncoming enemy with immediate success. The Persian archers and their light and heavy cavalry fell back and left a big gap in the Persian line. The Greeks immediately swung their horses round and made for the Persian center. They charged in the form of a wedge. The, the point rider was in command and the others paying no attention whatsoever to the enemy, followed in formation at a tremendous speed. It was like blasting a hole in the enemy defenses. As soon as they got round behind the front line, as they were able to create any amount of havoc among the foot soldiers who were waiting their turn to get into the fight. That troop of cavalry, who were called the Companions of Honor, were the finest cavalry in recorded history. Imagine the scene. Tens and thousands of screaming men intent on killing each other. There's a welter of spray and mud and falling bodies and dying horses and blood all over. At the other end of the line, down by the sea, Alexander's uh, brigades had held their positions, and now they too managed to break through. So that was the beginning of the end. Darius, realizing that he was being attacked by cavalry from both ends at the same time, decided to turn his chariot and uh, make a run for it. There's a story which is rather hard to believe, that uh, as he was swinging his horses round, uh, he and Alexander caught each other's eyes for a moment. Be that as it may, Alexander carved a path for himself and gave chase. The Persian king was in too much of a hurry. He left these behind. family wasn't so fortunate. I 
should have liked to have seen Alexander when he visited the Persian royal ladies. What a circus that was. Cats, dogs, eunuchs all over the place. And the women howling like hyenas. The Queen Mother mistook me for Alexander. When she apologized, Alexander said, Don't concern yourself, my lady, for he too is Alexander. I bet you appreciated that. Well, I'm only telling the stories are an example of his courtesy. After all, after the battle, he tended many of the wounded soldiers himself. He always showed infinite care for his army. The only trouble was, in the middle of all this, he still hadn't got his hands on Darius. No, but he captured most of his treasure. <laughs> the loss of treasure probably didn't concern Darius as much as the capture of his family. That was a personal as well as a political disaster. Alexander treated them well and tried to set their minds at rest. <laughs> These were extraordinary prisoners of war. There were Darius's children, Darius's mother, and Darius's wife, all now at the mercy of the Greeks, and Darius wanted them back. He sent messages to Alexander's headquarters offering to make a deal for their return. Yes, it's all very well for Darius to send envoys offering friendship in return for the release of his wife and family. But can he be trusted? I think not. Not while he has escaped us and is now at the other side of the Euphrates with several thousand men under arms. Scribe! Here is my reply to the defeated Darius. Your ancestors invaded Greece and caused destruction in the land. We had done nothing to warrant it. And now I, the supreme commander of all Greece, have come to Asia to punish the Persians for this crime. Your spies have over and again try to destroy the peace of the Greek city-states and to disunite a nation. It was then that I made war on you, and only then. I destroyed your generals and satraps in battle at Granicus. I defeated you and your entire army at Issus. And now, by the will of the gods, I am master of all that was once yours. You may request me for the return of your wife and family. I will listen to your requests. But you must attend upon me yourself, as you would attend upon the Lord of the continent of Asia. Do not send emissaries. From henceforth, do not address me as an equal. Everything you own is now mine. All your possessions are now mine. Tell me what you want, remembering who I am and the proper form of address and behavior, or I shall treat you like a common criminal. Should you decide to fight me for your throne, stand and fight, do not hide. For be certain, wherever you run, I shall find you. They didn't wait for a reply. Alexander moved his army south toward Tyre. It was a strategic port and he thought he might capture some of the Persian fleet at anchor there. With every marine conquest, his orders were to dispatch all vessels back to Greece where they could be manned by loyal Greek masters and crews. But if they found any Persian ships in Tyre, it was going to be very hard to get at them. Tyre was an island fortress of formidable proportions. They called it New Tyre. We already had the old town on the mainland itself, but New Tyre was a walled island about half a mile out to sea with two good harbors. One to the north, another to the southeast. At one point, the sea was 600 well, feet would deep. would have laid siege and starved them out. That would have taken too long. Anyway, they would have lived on fish. 
One thought Alexander's scheme possible. <laughs> he aimed not to tell the troops. He had seen Hercules in a dream beckoning him towards the city, inviting him in. And did they believe it? Some of them did. He may have done, for all I know. Hephaestion, did you believe that tale? Alexander's vision of Hercules. I believe in the spirit that lay behind it. Anyway, nothing would dissuade him, and we knew it, when he ordered that the old town should be taken apart stone by stone and used to build a causeway through the sea to the island. There was little for him to do while the causeway was being constructed, so Alexander went to Sidon, where a hundred warships had dropped anchor. Their masters had put in because they had nowhere to go. Alexander had captured their home ports. His tactics were paying off. It was good news. When uh, Alexander returned to Tyre, things were bad. The half-completed causeway had been severely damaged by a spring gale. He ordered it to be rebuilt. He sent ships carrying battering rams to break down the city's defenses. They failed. Uh, Stone-throwing catapults, the tallest siege towers the world had ever known up to that point, were built. Some of them 150 feet high, with drawbridges at various levels. And the Tyrians fought back with uh, flamethrowers, red-hot sand, harpoons, nets, arrows, rocks, anything to keep the Greeks at bay. After seven months, the final onslaught was launched with Alexander leading the attack. The Greeks entered the city and sacked it. Meanwhile, Darius had offered to make peace. Our lines are too stretched to even think of advancing any further. It's not a good idea, Alexander. Not with an army the size of ours. That's what they said before Tyre. But this is different. The Persian king has offered to surrender all the western provinces. It's a good offer. Why don't you accept it? Scribe! Take this message to Darius. From Alexander, Lord of Asia, to Darius. I say to you again, if you wish to talk to me, come before me in person and obey the proper formalities. If you want to ask me for mercy, ask me yourself. Do not send emissaries and letters. The Greek army moved south again toward Egypt. Alexander was still after the Persian fleet and he wasn't going to give up until he'd got it. But when he reached Gaza, he ran into trouble and Alexander was wounded. It was not the first time he had been injured in battle. His body already bore many scars, but it stopped his advance toward Egypt for a while. Alexander had good reason to believe that the conquest of Egypt would have been no easy matter, since his adversary, having been born and brought up in the desert, had developed a style of desert warfare which he and his men had never encountered. They entered Egypt at a place called Pelusium and proceeded with extreme caution. When they finally made contact with an Egyptian force, they took up battle order and continued to advance. The Egyptians advanced too, but in no battle order that he or his men could recognize. They looked more like a rabble than an army. When they are only a short distance apart, the Greeks stopped, held their positions, tense and wary. In front of them, the Egyptians, hundreds of them, milling around in the dust. And then, from the middle of the crowd, someone threw something. At first, nobody could see what it was. It, it fell in the dust, and the leading Greek horses skittered about. And then suddenly, the air was filled with missiles, multicolored missiles, which floated gently down around the Greeks. The Egyptians were bombarding them with flowers. Soon there were thousands of Egyptians running out to the edge of the desert, to cheering and strewing flowers as the conquering army moved on. It was a triumphant entry. Egypt belonged to Alexander. They 
left Pelusium along the Nile and headed toward Memphis, the capital city. There, the high priest of Memphis named Alexander the true pharaoh, the son of the living god Amon-Ra. And by virtue of that, he was, they declared, a living god himself. It was then that he founded the city which still bears his name today, Alexandria, on the delta of the River Nile. The story is that Alexander laid out the plan of the city himself. He instructed the architects on what he wanted, and they did his bidding. Only one thing remains to be done. To consult the oracle at Siwa. Well, that's hundreds of miles across the desert. Well, what's a desert? Hercules did it. There's one question which I have to ask which it alone can confirm. <laughs> the desert crossing to Siwa turned out to be even more difficult than Ptolemy had suggested. It was a hellish place. They ran out of supplies and water. At one point, they said they were led on by birds and talking snakes. They were probably delirious. But there was no turning back. Alexander had decided to reach the oracle and get there they would. by a sudden downpour. At last, they reached their destination. The priest at the temple bowed before Alexander and called him the son of Zeus. It was only confirmation of what his mother had always told him. Then he went to the oracle of Amun Ra and in a private alcove whispered one secret question and a low voice from within gave him the answer. I believe he asked the oracle to confirm his vision, to carry his conquest to the end of the world. If you wish to confirm that you are a god, you would best inquire of another god. He wrote to me, saying that I alone would be told the question he had asked the god. <laughs> but I could guess at it. It is what we had both always known. Well, I never asked him, but whatever it was, he was changed by it. He was never the same man again. with us anymore. He's thinking about the future. What is his future? No matter how warm the day, the stone always remains cool. This came from Siwa? Yes, the priest at the oracle gave it to me before we departed. What did they give to Alexander? The answer to his question, whatever that was. But he seemed pleased. And changed by it? Yes. He was different after Siwa. Alexander was always different. You heard the priests yourselves. They confirmed it. 
His army followed the light of the god in him. That's why men so willingly lay down their lives. Oh, yes, my lady. There's some not so willingly as others. It was spring. Alexander was now 25, a brilliant young battle commander. He led his troops out of Egypt and uh, headed north towards Tyre. Everybody knew what was in his mind now. The final showdown with Darius. Then he stopped and waited. He made no move. Weeks went by. We should strike now. The men are well trained and ready. They need action. The Persians are scattered. They've never been more vulnerable. We should mop them up. We wait here. Darius will try once more. When he thinks he is strong again, when he has all his troops in one army under one commander, then will be the moment when we shall decide who is Lord of Asia. One decisive battle. Winner take all. You have doubts on the winner, Hephaestion? No, but uh, I doubt if Darius will seek such a confrontation. He will be tempted. He will gather a grand army. And he will fight. <laughs> such a rigorous tuition. He was bright and learned well under Aristotle's aggressive teaching. To be ungenerous in one's thoughts, my prince, is another form of stinginess. It doesn't become you. Straight to the heart of the enemy. <clears throat> what Aristotle couldn't teach Alexander, he learned from his father. Philip had invented a new style of warfare, and the king made sure his son understood it. Straight to the heart of the enemy. One morning, when he was on his way to his daughter's wedding, Philip was brutally assassinated. Alexander became the king of Macedonia. He rallied the Greek city-states and led their combined armies to Asia to seek revenge upon Persia for defeats in generations past. Darius, the ruler of the Persian Empire, had been thoroughly beaten in battle. He was on the run with Alexander in hot pursuit. Then, to everyone's surprise, Alexander seemed to hesitate. The men are well trained and ready. They need action. The Persians are scattered. They've never been more vulnerable. We should mop them up. We wait here. Darius will try once more. When he thinks he is strong again, when he has all his troops in one army under one commander, then will be the moment when we shall decide who will be Lord of Asia. One decisive battle, winner take all. You have doubts on the winner, Hephaestion? <laughs> no, but uh, I doubt if Darius will seek such a confrontation. He will be tempted. He will gather a grand army. And he will fight. Meanwhile, we await his pleasure. Alexander could afford to wait. After the Battle of Issus, he had captured Darius's family, and he now held them prisoner. He treated his royal captives with consideration and respect. Darius's wife was expecting a child, and the baby was due. She was in poor health, and as the birth approached, she got worse. A woman cared for her as best they could. Alexander even sent his own physicians. Did everything possible, but... Uh... The wife of Darius died. In childbirth? Mm. Child, too. Well, 
The child had neither future nor past that could be honored. And did Darius ever come to hear of it? I don't know. But he lost two relatives with one death. For the Queen Statira was his sister as well as his wife. As was invariably the case when it came to strategy, Alexander's judgment was correct. Darius did, indeed, assemble an army, the largest, most formidable one in the history. It was impeccable. You have to admire him for that. Admire a coward? Persepolis was more important. That's what Alexander really wanted. But of course, that meant marching over mountains. We froze to death up there in December snows. That would have been of no account to Alexander. No, but that was the least of it in getting to Persepolis. Our guides led us to this place called the Gates of Persia. It was a narrow gorge with sheer walls of rock. There were thousands of Persians up there waiting for us. We were ambushed. There were rocks on us, fired catapults. We were tracked like animals in a pit. Many Greeks were slaughtered. It was our first real defeat since leaving home. <laughs> It is not wise, Alexander. I tell you, I will not leave here before we bury our dead. It's impossible. We shall only end with more. I will not leave our men to be dishonored by barbarians. I will not go. I just caught him. He's a shepherd. He claims to know of a goat track that leads up to the Persian encampment. Names like us. The shepherd was true to his word. He led the Greeks high into a canyon. They crawled towards the Persian camp along sheer goat tracks. What had looked like a defeat was turned into another victory. The Persians were caught completely by surprise, but Darius was not there. Alexander was a man for his food. His banquets were events to be remembered. It became a competition between governors and princes to see who could provide best for him. He did make a rule. <laughs> no one was allowed to spend more than a specified amount on the banquet for him. Well, of course. Stop anyone competing with him as a host. You serve me loyally. Eat well. Three weeks of nothing but bread and olives. How much longer? Do the men complain? Yeah. One more week. And then we march to Persepolis. Persepolis. Probably the grandest of the royal residences in the Persian Empire. A monument to the power and the glory of the Persian throne. magnificent ceremonial center and it came into its own every year for the New Year celebrations. Thousands of carved stone figures lined the walls recording the important people who visited. Satraps, ambassadors, generals, foreign dignitaries, many of them bearing gifts for the Persian monarch. 
They went to the banqueting halls, the formal reception areas, the council chambers, and the treasuries. And Alexander was going to have it, all of it. Food fit for sacrifice. I prefer Athenian cooking myself. You wound no one but the cook, it's delicious. Persephalus was the place to make the saliva run. There was nothing else in all the world like the spring feast at Persephalus. My cooks spent many days preparing food, enough for a city. And I had a eunuch who used to uh, devise the most exotic sweet meats that ever passed the lips. When we were there, we had doves boiled in wine and spices. You were among them at Persephalus? Yes. It's the most impressive palace I've ever seen. And the treasury of Persephalus. Astonishing. Such riches. Over 100,000 talents. How about the 100 column hall of Xerxes? Magnificent. It's a pity that. You offend the barbarian Ptolemy. Persepolis was a barbaric act, not worthy of any son of Greece. A glib opinion formed out of rumor and slander. Not rumor, madam, fact. You were both there. You know the truth. One of the most beautiful cities ever built, mercilessly sacked. If Timagines were here, he could tell you of the shame. Timagines? Why do you, like everyone else, always quote Timagines as your authority? He knew nothing. He wasn't even there. No, but they were both. And they remained silent. You know what they did? They let the troops loose on the population. They massacred and looted. They ripped jewels off women's bodies. It was a wild, evil frenzy. Look, Demosthenes, who would you know what happens to men in war? It was not Alexander's way to punish the Persian people. <laughs> Instead, he liberated them. And brought them to his side. He gave them just laws. And democracy! Then why Persepolis? The Athenian does not understand. It was months after we got there. Alexander had ordered all the treasure to be loaded for transport. And there was so much of it that, uh... We ignored some of it. There was gold in the walls of the palaces. But we couldn't remove it. Alexander had been away. When he came back, the gold and silver was being loaded for transport. It was legitimate wealth for Greece and for other purposes. Not for Alexander himself, whose share was no greater than any other officer's. You evade the issue. They took torches and fired everything that would burn. Tapestries, furnishings, everything. They see the wood rafters of Persepolis. Beautiful Persepolis. Burnt. Take care, Demosthenes. We know your cause. You smear, you belittle, you weave tissues of lies purely for your own political ends. There was a party, of course to celebrate departure on the morrow, was there not? There was good food like this, riotous company, and the wine flowed all evening. There was music and dances. But that wasn't enough for Alexander, was it? With more wine in his veins than blood, he set fire to the hundred-columned hall of Xerxes, and you all ran amok and joined in. Doesn't the sweet smell of burning cedar wood fill your nostrils still? It was justified revenge on the Persians for what they did to the temples of Athens. At the time, it was my belief he had planned it all along. So much care had been taken to strip the treasures and remove them out of harm's way. 
After all, he didn't want to leave all those magnificent palaces for a Persian governor to live in, did he? You too have your case. It was all too obvious. Alexander always called Persepolis the most hated city in Asia. I never heard him say that. Anyway, the plan was to leave thousands of troops in garrison when we'd gone. So there could have been no premeditation. Alexander did not wantonly destroy Persepolis. You heard what Hephaestion said. He sacrificed it. He had to, for what the Persians did to the temples of Athens. He sacrificed Persepolis to the gods. As with so many other aspects of Alexander's story, historians are still arguing about the motives for the destruction of Persepolis. Was it an accident or a political gesture because he felt that Persepolis could be too dangerous to leave as a symbol of the old regime? Or a moment of revenge? Nobody knows. But it does have significance in another way. It marks a point in Alexander's life at which his talents as a military genius become less important. Unless he was to hand over to somebody else, he had to start behaving like a king to become the effective ruler of the Asia which he'd so decisively conquered, in fact, to be king of Persia. The great crusade was ended, Greece had been avenged. So at this moment, he released his allies from the Greek city-states, paid them off. But for himself, he was determined not to give up the pursuit of Darius. From now on, Alexander's troops were in it for the adventure and for share of any booty that might be going. And perhaps Alexander had another reason for continuing with the hunt. His mother had told him often enough that he was related through her to Achilles. He had always tried to compete with the Greek hero's achievements. Achilles would never have allowed a Persian enemy to escape, and neither would Alexander. Which I will command, and we will go by this route here. Cratorus will command... He had a the... profound and he almost mystical Asia, belief in himself and his destiny, and it communicated itself to the men around him. He knew they would follow him in the chase for Duras. They had been away from Greece for three years. They had carved their way into the heart of the Persian Empire, from Troy to Memphis, from Tyre to Persepolis. The spoils of war had made them all wealthy. By now, Alexander was the richest man in the world, but riches were not enough to satisfy the reincarnation of Achilles. He had to find Darius. The end of Darius is at hand. The Persian, Bessus, has rebelled, taken command, and holds the king. The Greek mercenaries, who remained loyal to Darius, have left to make their own escape. We must have the king in our chains. Bessus must have 15,000 men, Alexander. We waste time. That barbaric Persian. He called himself the king. Because, as he was fond of saying, there was only one. <laughs> True indeed. But not of him. Alexander was the king. After two days of hard riding across the corner of the desert, Alexander finally caught up with the Persian king.
man is this Bezos, who is both traitor and murderer to his own king, and leaves him with less dignity than carrion. Well, it was a surprise to many. Alexander caring for the body of Darius. And a week later, he sent the body back for a royal funeral. And then he made Darius his brother, a Macedonian companion. Alexander accorded Darius honors he had never earned. And buried him as the hero he never was. You would accuse Alexander for an act of compassion? I think it was an act of statesmanship. I've no doubt that Alexander was a shrewd man. Indeed, what I learned from him came to be of great use to me when I became Pharaoh of Egypt. Then you should thank him, Pharaoh. For although many may lead, few have the grace to rule wisely. I wondered how he would reconcile such an extended reign with the thing that really mattered to him. Finding the great sea on the edge of the world to the east. Catching up with Bessus at the same time. Perhaps the fact that his own father had been assassinated had something to do with it. There was no giving up. He tracked Bessus relentlessly for hundreds of miles. Eventually, they reached the mountains of the Hindu Kush, which were said to be close to the edge of the world. All they had to do was to climb those peaks. The climb to the summit took a week. We suffered badly in the snow. But Alexander was eager to get there, so he pushed us on. Finally, we stood on what must have been the top of the world. I've never seen Alexander look so dejected. He thought he was going to see the sea spilling over its edge. Instead, there was just cloud and more mountains. The descent to the north lasted 10 days. Supplies ran out. The horses died, we let them roar. Eventually, we reached the plains of Bactria. Bessus was gone. So we chased after him. We expected a battle when we caught up, but instead, we were met by a few horsemen who offered to turn him over in return for protection for their families. Bessos, the assassin. I am Alexander of Macedon, ruler of all Asia. First you shall be scourged. Then you shall be punished by your own people, your nose and ears cut then off. He carefully avoided involving the Greeks in the execution of Bessos. It was an astute move. The Persians themselves could have that satisfaction, and they'd probably thank him for it. This is the sentence passed on you for the murder of Darius. The eunuch Bagoas was given to Alexander as a formal gift. He had been eunuch to Darius. The function of a court eunuch was well understood by the Greeks. Someone like Bagoas could be loyal and very useful. In time, he might even become an influential figure in Alexander's Persian court. Some eunuchs had well-deserved reputations for ruthlessness. Sometimes the very survival of their masters could be in their hands. Beneath this bizarre makeup was a tough and intelligent man, and Alexander knew it.
From him they would learn about the intricate manners of the East. A discreet eunuch could interpret the formal behavior and customs of Persian court life. Alexander would have need of someone like that. Without much doubt, he'd be a useful man to have around. It was too difficult for some to accept the Persian ways. I can understand that. No Greek wishes to bow to any man, whether the man be a simple master or a king. Yes, I've met few who'll be robbed of their pride, and rightly so. But surely ignorance can be the only excuse for those who refuse to bow to Alexander. For what Greek would consider himself robbed of his pride by honoring the son of a god? But he had to be obeyed. And in order to be obeyed by the Persians, he had to exact from them the reverence they had given to Darius. But he did not have to exact anything of the like from us. Yes, but the Persians knew he claimed to be a god. If they believed this, they would accept him on the throne. But they were never going to believe it as long as we treated him as a mere mortal. And so we all had to grovel, Greeks and Persians alike. That's where it started to go wrong. You had no choice. There are not enough Greeks to rule the Persians, unless the Persians cooperate. And they will only do that if they are allowed to share the government. Then you must encourage the Persians to behave like Greeks. No. Encourage the Greeks to behave like Persians. Only the monarch understands the role of the throne. Of course, there are those who know better. They sit on the sidelines, sniping, criticizing, usually in secret. One learns to disregard them or silence them. Eliminate the opposition, eh? What? But when you silence the hornet, the swarms come looking for the remains. That's the risk. Hmm. One also learns to disregard hornets. That much power in the hands of any one man. Whoever he is, is dangerous. It finally corrupts a civilized society. Just look at the king of Persia. A victim of his own power, if ever there was one, surrounded by flattery and downright lies. And Alexander was fast going the same way. Visitors to Alexander's quarters discovered that he was indeed trying to rule the Persians by encouraging the idea that they should regard him as one of them. Some of the older Greek veterans were disgusted by this change of style. For them, all Persians were barbarians and would remain so. should have his tongue cut out. Persian catamite. These are unwise words for a Greek soldier. You are drunk, Clytus. Drunk? This Greek drunk saved Alexander's life. Uh, can the king remember, Granicus? We find you insulting, Clytus. Oh, we is it now. You know, Alexander, I rather envy my friends who fell in battle. You know why, Alexander? Because they did not live to see you dressed like a Persian harlot, surrounded by cringing, slimy eunuchs. Enough. Euripides must have had you in mind, Alexander. He said it all. When the public spends its hard-earned cash on setting up a monument of war, in huge as capitals, you'll find the name of some effeminate field marshal who fanned himself while others plied their spears. to happen 
happened so quickly. Alexander took the spear from your body and tried to kill himself with it. Well, they wrestled him down and he just lay there without moving. He was in a trance. We carried him like that to his bed. I stayed with him all night. He wept like a child. He didn't seem to hear or see anything around him. Was the Bershans? He had to be told that he had not done wrong. He had not done wrong. Clytus had spoken treason. Alexander had not done wrong. But Alexander refused to leave his bed. Some say that it was Ptolemy who solved the problem. He brought an old philosopher called Anaxarchus to talk to Alexander. He flattered and cajoled him. He reminded him that he was the son of Zeus and told him to remember that his destiny was to continue until he reached the end of the world. He must never forget that. He must fulfill his destiny. It is said that when he heard Anaxarchus' words, Alexander sat up having evidently come to terms with his intense sense of guilt. And his troops supported him by declaring their own verdict that for his treason, Clytus' death was no more than justice. So why did Alexander behave like this? Shame at losing his self-control was probably at the heart of it. All his life he had withstood terrible hardships and pain without giving in. And now he had broken under the taunts of a drunken general. His hero, Achilles, would never have allowed that to happen. It was not remorse for killing Clytus in a rage. He was grieving for his own frailty. He had shown himself to be vulnerable, and for Alexander, that was the worst kind of failure. Alexander kills in rage, and then he repents. And you all scurry around, giving birth to excuses for him, like some panicky midwives. Show me the man who says he doesn't need the understanding of others, and I'll point you to a liar. Point me to a king who doesn't expect flattery from his court. And I will show you a hypocrite. What evidence have you, Demosthenes, that Alexander was the victim of flattery? I didn't say that. But I believe that once the Persians had infiltrated their ways into his thoughts and made him believe that their ideas were his own, it was the beginning of the end. That's not evidence, Demosthenes. It's not even true. I don't know why you say these things. Oh, a fear. That's the reason. What he doesn't understand, he fears. Demosthenes, the Democrat, doesn't understand the role of the throne. So he fears it and then he attacks it. It's second nature to him. Politicians are not above flattery. Oh, do let me speak, woman. A man can't even draw breath. What I was going to say is that the role of the throne is to create and sustain the organization of the realm. Alexander understood that. He should have done. I told him often enough. What he was doing in the Persian courts beyond me. But I don't criticize because I don't understand. Now that's the difference between a king and a politician. Alexander was a brilliant administrator. We may have doubted his wisdom at times, but he was invariably right. Have you all finished? When my son was 20, he was king. When he was 25, he had wiped out the Persian barbarians and set about the business of ruling them. Of course, he was a brilliant administrator. Conquer and pillage, Philip, that was you. Conquer, then administer and organize wisely. That was Alexander. He had to ensure Persian loyalty throughout his vast empire. That's why he had to be seen demonstrating at least some of their habits. Oh, and as for you, Athenian, what did you ever do to administer the Persian barbarians? Even when it was safe to go, you never even went to see what Alexander had achieved. That is not the point, It is Madam. the point. 
He told me, he told me in his letters, the young barbarians were the promise for the future. They were the ones who had to be taught the values and the standards and the language of Greece. It was Alexander who showed them. Not Athenian politicians. And you say it's nothing to do with me? And he learnt nothing from Athenian culture, oh, really, madam? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, he learnt all right. He learnt to assess and reject theories. He put his wisdom into practice. What theories did he... There was no doubt that Alexander was going through a difficult time. As ruler of Persia, he had decided not to impose Greek ways on his Persian court. But at the same time, he was also king and commander of his own Greek troops. And they wanted him to behave like a Greek. It was all a question of standards. I helped him to realize that we at court had become used to certain strict traditions and etiquette. And that it would make matters easier if he observed at least some of the Persian customs. He caught the diseases of the Persian court, suspicion and intrigue. I often warned my son in my letters to guard against plots on his life. I feared for his safety. But he claims to know of a goat track that leads up to the Persian encampment. His name's Lycus. The shepherd was true to his word. He led the Greeks high into a canyon. They crawled towards the Persian camp along sheer goat tracks. What had looked like a defeat was turned into another victory, and that his own officers should then deal with the matter. No trial, no defense, no inquiry. That was the Persian influence, all right. The army objected to it. But they soon settled down. I don't think Alexander ever really trusted any of us again. He was just more careful, that's all. We agreed that when at court, he would wear the traditional headdress of the Persian king, and we discussed the matter of his other apparel. And then, Alexander said he wanted to hold a full gathering of his Greek staff to introduce this new etiquette. It seemed a sensible idea. Alexander, you are by far the bravest man any of us has known, and you deserve that honor, and our honor. But there is a difference between honoring a man and crawling to him on your hands and knees. As a Greek, I am happy to kiss you as an equal, but I will not bow down before any man. Kneel, Callisthenes. I am the poorer by one kiss. Persian court life was a burden to Alexander. He was at his best and his happiest when he was leading his Greek soldiers. And as always, conquests lay towards the east. They moved on to Sogdia, which is where eastern Afghanistan is today. The Sogdian rock is one of nature's oddities. It's a great pillar of stone, three miles high and 15 miles in circumference, an impregnable citadel.
Alexander called for 300 experienced Greeks from the mountains of Epirus and Macedonia. They were issued with iron tent pegs for pitons and long lengths of linen rope. There was to be a prize for the first one to the top, 12 silver talents, worth about 48 years of combat pay. By the morning, it was all over. The castle and the rock were in Greek hands. Among the prisoners was a girl called Roxanne. Alexander went to inspect her. She was the king of Sogdia's daughter. Quite a surprise. He fell in love. Politics. Father would be useful. Perhaps he thought it would impress the men. They like to see human warmth in their leaders. I don't think that Roxanne was the recipient of very much warmth. Still, they went through the ceremony. Of course, you did bear him a son, though he didn't live to see him. Well, I cared more for his men than he ever did for Roxanne. Because he really needed them for what he wanted most. His journey to India and the end of the world. In June of the year 327 BC, Alexander once again set about crossing the formidable Hindu Kush mountains, this time toward the east, behind him an army of 50,000 men. Tales of India had been part of Alexander's education ever since he began his studies with Aristotle. There were said to be gigantic ants which dug gold out of the earth in India. And there were seapods, which were men with one foot, which was large enough to use as a sunshade if they lay on their backs. There were unicorns with blue eyes and red heads. And Alexander had been told about natives who were 200 years old, and pygmies, and griffins, which were said to guard the treasures of the continent. So at the age of 29, he was now on the edge of this unknown place, and he wanted desperately to be the first man from the West to succeed in conquering it. If he was disappointed at not finding unicorns and griffins in India, there were many other things to interest him. He saw elephants for the first time and fought against armies of Indians that used the creatures as living battering rams against his troops and cavalry. Eunuch's been telling me tales of war elephants with iron tusks. Is it true? You fought with them? Yes, we fought with them. Nature's great engines of war, the largest animal in the world. Yes, of course we fought with them. The horses were scared witless. But Alexander beat these engines of war, eh? Oh, I wish I'd seen that. As for the rest, I would have done it myself, but I'd like to have seen that. Then you would have enjoyed the battle. There had been many of the months before that because the Indians were great fighters. But King Porus himself was a different man. Well, what happened? The monsoon season had arrived. The sky for days had poured tons of water on us. And Alexander led us to the banks of the Hadaspes River, which had risen 30 feet in three days. Oh. And there, on the other side, on the bank, was the army of King Porus. 200 war elephants, 230,000 Punjab infantry, and 5,000 mounted cavalry. It was only 11,000 of us. Aye. Yes, but we arranged battle formations and made ready. Every 50 feet, there was an elephant. Between them, bowmen. Behind them, the drummers sounding the call. 
and in front of them King Porus himself at the head. As was invariably the case when it came to strategy, Alexander's judgment was correct. Darius did, indeed, assemble an army, the largest, most formidable one in the history of warfare up to that time. He chose to fight in a place called Galgamela. The Greeks completed their move to the battleground in late September. Alexander had been waiting for this moment since May. Gargamela was really the most decisive battle in uh, Alexander's entire career. Its significance was that the outcome would decide who was to rule Asia. Darius, king of the Persian Empire, or Alexander of Greece. It was a very narrow thing. Both sides won advantages and then lost them, while tens of thousands of foot soldiers and cavalry fought it out in a sea of whirling dust. From one hour to another, nobody really knew how the battle stood. But there's one thing we can be sure about, was that a wing of cavalry, led by Alexander himself, spearheaded an attack and tore a hole in the Persian lines, just in front of Darius's own position. That was enough for Darius. Once again, he fled the battlefield. This is what war was like 2,000 years ago. The battlefield crammed with men and horses waiting their turn to do combat. Very often, for hours at a time, only the front ranks of the armies actually fought each other. The others waited their turns, and only when the men in front fell did they step over the bodies and join in the fight. It was from a scene like this that Darius was making his escape. After the decisive victory at Gaugamela, the way was open to Babylon, a place of palaces, lush estates, and riches. The Greeks thought they would have to fight for this rare prize. Alexander made his usual careful preparations, but the city gates were opened from within, and the Greeks entered to garlands of flowers, gifts, and dancing in the streets. For more than a month, the army lived off the fat of the land. Alexander himself moved into Nebuchadnezzar's old palace, 600 rooms stuffed with priceless furniture and treasures. Everyone, down to the most junior recruit, got a share of the booty. Once again, they were all wealthy men. But Alexander was not satisfied with that. He wanted Darius in chains. The Persian king was not to be caught so easily. His judgment and always knowing when to get out was impeccable. You have to admire him for that. Admire a coward. Persepolis was more important. That's what Alexander really wanted. But of course, that meant marching over mountains. We froze to death up there in December snows. That would have been of no account to Alexander. No, but that was the least of it in getting to Persepolis. Our guides led us to this place called the Gates of Persia. It was a narrow gorge with sheer walls of rock. There were thousands of Persians up there waiting for us. We were ambushed. There were rocks on us, fired catapults. We were tracked like animals in a pit. Many Greeks were slaughtered. It was our first real defeat since leaving home. <laughs> Is not wise, Alexander. I tell you, I will not leave here before we bury our dead. It's impossible. We shall only end with more. I will not leave our men to be dishonored by barbarians. I will not go. I just caught him. He's a shepherd. He claims to know of a goat track that leads up to the Persian encampment. 
His name's Lycus. The shepherd was true to his word. He led the Greeks high into a canyon. They crawled towards the Persian camp along sheer goat tracks. What had looked like a defeat was turned into another victory. The Persians were caught completely by surprise. But Darius was not there. He had conquered the most powerful empire in the world and he was 28 years old. Darius was dead. He was now king of Persia. But Alexander showed no signs yet of wanting to return home to Greece. He, the son of Zeus, a reincarnation of Achilles, had yet to fulfill his destiny. The role of King of Persia, Lord of Asia, brought some unique problems for Alexander. His early efforts to unite the Greek soldiers with the Persians that they had conquered provoked a lot of grumbling. They resented the idea that the Persians should be regarded as equals. Like Alexander himself, his veterans had been brought up with the idea that anybody born outside Greece was a barbarian. It was a sticking point, and not many were prepared to change their minds. This is not what I would have done. That is not surprising, my dear Philip. Alexander had a plan far beyond your comprehension. Policy. Pure, shrewd, cannily woven policy. He had to hold the two empires together, and the Persian was great in extent. Now, but that was no reason why they shouldn't have been forced to adopt the ways of the king who conquered them. Force was never Alexander's way. He wanted to unite and civilize his empire. That had always been his aim. Instead, it was the other way around. There's no such thing as the unity of mankind. It's not in man's nature. There are only two kinds of people, the conquerors and the vanquished. And so it will be to the end of the world. Oh, yes. First conquer, then rape, then pillage. Then return home for a hero's reward. Then start all over again until death or defeat puts pay to the spectacle. Alexander shared the same ambition, madam. Your son was no different. Alexander's empire was the greatest in the world. <laughs> and he organized and administered it as no man has ever done before or since. Oh, yes. Highly organized rape and pillage. That was Alexander's way. Rubbish, Demosthenes. Highly organized economic planning and administration. That's what Alexander was about. In the tradition of Macedonian kings, and that he inherited from me. Alexander would have given it all to have reached the end of the world, where the great sea spills over its edge. The whole time we were in India, he searched for it. We never really knew where we were. We thought we were somewhere quite close to Egypt. Well, the Indian rain soon put a stop to it. So we're stuck in that miserable mud forever. I was relieved when Alexander made his decision. He was the only one that wanted to go on. Brave soldiers, you have endured much. I ask no more. The omens are not favorable. Zeus is warning me. We leave India. We shall return. Very cunning of him. Why do you try and denigrate every good and noble purpose my son ever had? Is it because you've never been able to share in his vision or perception? He certainly had to have plenty of that, particularly with his troops against him. The army was not against Alexander. It was the Indian rain. It permeated the whole being and robbed them of their will. Willingness to stupidly follow him any further. It was not just a huge army of foot soldiers and cavalry who were returning through the wet, but along with them came an enormous baggage train. Elephants. 
Thousands of wives, whores, children, scientists, historians, cookshop keepers, contractors, craftsmen, cutthroats. It was like a crawling city without a roof moving across the earth. They had come a long way and it wasn't going to be easy to return. The quickest way out of India was to follow the Jhelum River down to the sea, then head along the coast towards Persia. In less than two months, we had built a thousand ships on the banks of the river. But the problem was we were 120,000 men. So Alexander had to divide us into three groups for a journey down the coast. I was in the left bank. Crotters was on the right. Alexander was with the ships. It was an incredible sight. A thousand boats moving down these waters, the smack of sails in the wind, the cries of a thousand bosuns, the beat of a hundred thousand drums. They were passing through hostile territory and it was inevitable they would be challenged. They expected it. It was at Multan, a citadel on the banks of the river. Godless, cursed place. The men were badly outnumbered and hesitated to mount the siege lines. Twice they balked, till Alexander fought his way through to lead the way. Men without a true leader are as goats. Yes, but he scaled the ramparts and jumped to the ground inside the fortress. I think his bravery was his undoing. The arrow was stuck in his chest, but he kept on fighting. But did none of you run to him? He didn't call. <sighs> he could bear pain like no one I ever saw. There, Demosthenes, make mockery of that if you will. I will not, madam. But I will say he would not have felt it at first. It is well known that in battle the fire and the muscle blocks out the pain. Yeah, that's true. Yes, my lady, it's happened to me. But he must have felt it afterwards, Hephaestion, surely. No doubt, but I was with another column. When we heard, we couldn't believe anyone could survive such a wound. The arrowhead was cut out after three days, but he insisted on rejoining the main army, so we had to bring him down river by boat. I saw him approaching. First, I thought I was looking at his dead body. His flesh was ashen white. But as the ship came nearer, he suddenly raised his arm and waved. The whole army roared. They got to the shore, rode on his horse to the camp, dismounted, walked, to show them that not only was he still alive, but he was still in command. Blood was spurting from his wound. But he turned to the cheering men, waved, smiled. We went into the tent and I caught him as he collapsed. Eventually he was well enough and they set sail down the river again. At last they reached the coast and the Indian Ocean. Alexander was now 31. Wherever he journeyed, he'd founded cities and towns, many of them named Alexandria. He'd set up garrisons and he'd built harbors and roads and bridges. And it was all part of an overall strategy. He wasn't just conquering and capturing. He was creating a network of communications. He was eliminating borders, breaking down walls, so that along those fine new roads of his, the message of Greek civilization could travel. Greek poetry, Greek philosophy, Greek reasoning, the Greek Argus knowledge. Now. Greek economics, Greek trade. It will carry but the here, on the shores of the we Indian Ocean, he now had to decide where to go, the and then how to get there. I shall go by this route here. Craterus will command the 3rd Division, which will go by the easier overland route to Persia. The wounded and the veterans will go with him. Yes, but most of the Indian guides have deserted. Then we go without them. If the fleet 
and the army. Each find routes west to the mouth of the Euphrates. Then we shall have another link between Asia and India. That is the objective. Do you understand? I shall prepare sacrifices for the gods. And what are the sacrifices? The ones I promised should I reach the end of my journey. Have you? The sacrifices will not be wasted. When I have finished, prepare the fleet to move from the delta out into the ocean. You see, the difference between the deed and the word can be great. We marched off as planned, not knowing the whole fleet was stuck in the delta. As well as the winds, there were the tides. Twice a day, the sea rose and fell, almost to the height of a man. This mysterious rhythm. It's no mystery, although only a woman might understand. From what you say, it would seem that the Indian Sea is commanded not by a god, but a goddess. Well, there's a goddess that didn't favor the fleet. <laughs> They were stuck to the shore. Indian raiding parties tried to burn the grain boats. And they were soon caught up in short but bloody skirmishes. The fleet was delayed for three months. And when we arrived at the first meeting place on the coast, we despaired because there was no sign of the boats. Because there was no sign of the boats. We needed supplies, for we hadn't found any on the way. Alexander even suspected treachery. And that Nyarkas had been given false information about her plans having been changed. He took the only option available to him, to turn and land, in the hope of finding new supply routes there. First it wasn't too bad, but then it turned out to be the worst journey of my life. The inland route was desert. The water was poisonous. Some drank it, their bellies swelled, and they died. That year, there was a plague of vipers. When one struck, the victim was dead in minutes. Alexander led them on, tens of thousands of them struggling through the sand, and many dying along the way. The men still worshipped him as a god. They would have followed him into the jaws of hell. Many did. In less than two months, 2,000 men had died and their bones had been left to the vultures. And the final disaster came. A huge sandstorm. Many men died, the animals were suffocated. Then, we knew we were lost. I all but sat down and wept. We were absolutely lost. The only thing we could assume was that the ocean lay somewhere to the south. Alexander led a scouting mission for the sea, but it was a forlorn hope. I went with him. We traveled in the heat of the day. First the horses died, then one by one, the soldiers just dropped. We left them there. It's landmarks for the way back. Alexander led. There's only five of us left. It was all burnt and blackened by the sun. The Gedrosian Desert. None of us ever expected anything like that. My sympathy is there, but don't mistake me for it is limited. It is one thing for a soldier to follow his commanders and be prepared to die for him, but quite another for all those who feel compelled or have no alternative but to follow in their wake. The traders, artists, wives and children, scientists. The sorrow of those I shall keep most for my memory. There was a godsend that the 3rd Division with all the veterans and the wounded had been sent over land. 
and that tells us they would have been the first to die. Oh, but don't forget, Alexander saved many thousands from the desert. Without him, no one would have survived. Without him, no one would have gone into the desert in the first place. <laughs> the inland route was the only one that promised supplies. It was the right decision. looking for? Niarchus. When he finishes his voyage, he will come across land and support me. Even if he's still alive, how will he know where we are? He will find me. The fleet had survived. Niarchos and four officers struggled for weeks overland to try to locate Alexander and his army. It's said that when he finally caught up, Niarchos was in such a bad state himself that he was unrecognizable. Alexander wept unashamedly for joy at the return of his old friend and announced that he was worth more to him than the continent of Asia itself. And that was saying something, because by now, Alexander had convinced himself that he was the ruler of the whole of Asia. And that meant he ruled the entire world as it was known then. For more than two years they'd been away from Persia. Now Alexander was on his way back, and when he returned, there'd be many who'd be sorry, especially Persian governors who'd been disloyal. The nagging problem still remained. Were Alexander and his Greek army in Persia to rule as conquerors, or were they going to merge with the Persians and become a single nation at peace? He never made any secret that he wanted to merge. The army was still openly opposed to the whole idea. But Alexander was determined to get his own way. Let's look at this place. The person influences everywhere. As for you, they never change people like you, do they? As for personizing a Greek army and that scheme for intermarriage, it's disgusting. It was my master's insistence that partnership and concord should be the rule for the future. Eunuch, you make me sick. My master himself organized many of the marriages for his officers. Yes, he chose one for me. Well, she came with a good dowry, I say that for her. Well bred. Never opened her mouth unless requested. Marrying the officer class into the enemy side. Unheard of in all history. For the sake of harmony and concord, and with respect, sir, we were no longer the enemies of Alexander. At least their children would be half Greek. It makes sense. Shrewd political sense. As long as Greek fathers remain the masters. And to crown it all, he then chooses himself to marry that Bosni woman, the daughter of Darius. And also take the second youngest daughter of Artaxerxes. So at one and the same time, he was knowingly polluting himself with both royal households of Persia. It's unbelievable. No. No, that at least does make sense. I organized many of the weddings. You did what, eunuch? Ninety-two bridal suites were specially prepared. <laughs> there was a hall built with a hundred bedrooms. All the beds were decorated with the finest silk. My master's own bed had legs of pure gold. Gold legs? Nothing was 
too good for the occasion. The wedding party was stupendous. It went on for five days with entertainments and plays, comedies and tragedies. It was a tragedy, all right. You're staying very silent, you fistian. Did Alexander choose a bride for you too? Dara is his youngest daughter. All that blood of your companion spilled, only for you to be forced to bed with your defeated enemy's youngest daughter. Demosthenes, the purpose was serious enough. <laughs> of course it was. Alexander wanted to make his world one. With one king. That was the whole idea, Olympias. That the future would lie in the hands of the children of the people Alexander conquered. They would learn the Greek language and culture. They would share Alexander's vision. Persian speaking Greek. There's a foundation for treachery. Seems, sir, that a king as yourself can sometimes share the good sense of the common man. I hear the army didn't think much of the idea either. There was a certain reaction against the training of young Persians as replacements for our army, and that was all. Persians in the Greek army? Yes, but they're a special elite force. 30,000. But no one ever knew, because they spoke Greek and wore Macedonian uniforms. But I saw them. They were very, very good. And when they came to Seuss at the parade in front of Alexander, they performed military operations with great skill. They were the only replacements when the veterans had been sent home. Was my son mad? I don't blame you for the dullness of your wits. He could visualize a future none of you could even begin to imagine. Well, I must admit, my lady, it was a witlessness shared by many of the veterans. They felt insulted at being replaced by Persian boys. In the end, the veterans' resentment exploded into open hostility. It was mutiny. You no longer trust me. You speak treason openly to my face. You no longer love me. The wealth of the world flows now into your hands. You have become captains, generals. You have become my governors of provinces. I have done this for you. And I keep nothing for myself. I have paid your debts, even though you have earned countless war booty. And those who have died in battle, they are honored. Their parents are honored. And all you want is to desert me. Well, go then. Leave me to the mercy of barbarian men. Out of my sight. Huh? As soon as I am within, seal this tent and let none enter until further orders. Once again, like Achilles at Troy, he will retire to his tent and remain there for days. Yes, but last time in India, it didn't work. Then he needed their loyalty. Now they need his. Yes. Yes, he had no threat to wield against them. But now he threatens to give every post to Persian officers. Look at them. They whip children at their supper. This time, it is they who will sue for pardon. Ptolemy wasn't wrong. The veterans had second thoughts, and they begged for Alexander's forgiveness. We are one, then.
Be warned. Well, the mutiny was dealt with. Alexander gave a banquet as a gesture of reconciliation. 9,000 men attended. The Greeks sat in an inner ring, circled by Persians in an outer ring, and they all prayed for unity and concord. It was a considerable achievement to getting these Greek and Persian soldiers together in this way, and Alexander had good reason to be satisfied and to mark the occasion 10,000 older and wounded Greek soldiers were sent home with full pay plus one silver talent, which today is the equivalent of um, 60,000 American dollars. Alexander's old friend Craterus was put in charge and his instructions were to lead the veterans back to Macedonia. In his capacity as Hegemon, supreme commander of the Pan-Hellenic Union, Alexander sent a proclamation to Greece which was read out before 20,000 people at the Olympic Games. Having achieved against the odds a considerable measure of harmony in Persia, he urged the Greek city-states to allow all those who had been exiled for political reasons to return to their homes and their property. The city-states agreed. Alexander was too powerful a figure to Athens, Demosthenes had something to say about that. In my opinion, the man has become a megalomaniac. But we have to give in to his request, unless we want the Acropolis burnt to the ground. We have to receive all sorts of criminals back from exiles, and be prepared, my friends. They will demand their property and their goods, forfeited by them, by judgment under the law, when they were properly exiled by judgment under the law. But what can we, law-abiding citizens, do about it under our misguided protector, Alexander? Nothing! Nothing! Life was about to change for them all now. Games and celebrations were held at the stadium in Ekpatana. Alexander knew how to throw a party. Day after day, the countryside around echoed with the festivities. But Hephaestion couldn't attend. He'd caught a fever. There was nothing unusual in that, but Alexander was concerned for his friend. Well, it was a pity the games had to continue without him. But we didn't think it was serious. After all, which of us had not suffered fever before? Hephaestion was a tough campaigner. The physician said, you must fast. And Hephaestion ate a boiled chicken and washed it down with a flagon of wine. He should have heeded the physician. Yes, he should have. He became very ill and over the next few days, he got worse. When Alexander heard it at the stadium, he rushed to him. But Hephaestion was dead. I'd never seen Alexander so devastated before. He wept, cried out in agony. Alexander, you must leave now. Not yet. You do Hephaestion no service by keeping him here with you. Not until the sun rises. The sun is no friend of the dead. We decree that the manes and tails of all the horses in the cavalry be shaven. That in our royal palace there be no singing of songs, nor playing of musical instruments for one year. That the regiment of horse that Hephaestion commanded shall forevermore bear the title of Hephaestion's regiment. That every city in our empire shall mourn for three months.
My master commissioned artists to build shrines and statues to the dead hero. Funeral games were held. In Hamadan, Alishander ordered the carving of a great and powerful lion as a memorial to his friend, Hephistion. A delegation was sent to Egypt to the oracle at Siwa to ask whether Hephistion too might be considered a god. The oracle said he might be a demigod, but not a god. I've never seen a man so affected by death. He didn't eat or drink for days. Ethelpus, in his writing, said that Alexander went completely out of his mind with grief. He started wearing the sacred clothes of the gods at dinner parties. Sometimes he even put on the dress of the goddess Artemis, even when he wrote his chariot. Can't a king mourn a beloved friend in peace? Six weeks after the funeral, Alexander led a small force against a tribe of nomads that was causing trouble in the hills. It was hardly a difficult job for the man who had conquered the known world. His private thoughts were elsewhere. He was making plans to invade Arabia. About that time, an old seer at the palace reported finding bad omens for the future in the lobes of a sheep's liver. It was a strange time. Omens. Rumors of omens. Many more sheep were sacrificed, but only to produce more warnings. Alexander paid little heed to them. As we were boarding a boat, my master's crown fell from his head into the river and had to be recovered. Everyone said that was an omen. There was only one omen Alexander was looking for. Of that, I'm sure the one that would ensure the success of his intentions. Mm -hmm. That uh, notion of integration. It's disheartening that he failed to judge the Persian barbarians for what they really were. Great disappointment that he failed in that lesson. <laughs> your criticism, Aristotle, tells us more about your lack of vision than it does about Alexander's. Uh, <laughs> you mistake the intention, madam. I, I don't criticize, I assess. You see, Alexander was my pupil. And it's my responsibility to judge his progress. Under my tuition, Alexander learned all about sciences and philosophies. He absorbed the import of what I taught him and, for the most part, put it to use during his lifetime. That, after all, is the purpose of learning, is it not? Now you see fit to preen yourself with his achievements. What audacity. I devoted a considerable part of my life to the boy's education. I don't think it's unreasonable to claim some minor credit. I think you're being a little hard on the philosopher, madam. I am merely assessing the extent of his philosopher's ego. <laughs> I say this much for you, Aristotle. Without your training, the organization of a great many campaigns would have been far less tedious. Whenever I commanded them, I was sick of the eternal demands of the botanists, the doctors, the philosophers, all vying with each other for the acquisition of a new piece of unique knowledge. That was your influence, Aristotle. But whatever anybody said, Alexander always took them along with him. Perfectly correct. <laughs> I didn't go wrong when I chose you for that job. No. I always feel that Alexander's education branded his personality and, consequently, his life's achievements. As we know, knowledge lives on through generations, so it's an undeniable fact that Alexander affected the course of civilization. Well, we all, in our various ways, do that. 
Alexander left a permanent mark on this world, and it was not just because he had a clever teacher, Philip. Only gods may change this world. And that's what Alexander did. I remember in India once, Alexander asked one of their philosophers, what must a man do to become a god? And he replied, to do something a man cannot do. I wonder, did Alexander do it? Ever do anything that a man cannot do? Well, in broad terms, I'd have done more or less what he did. <laughs> you unite the world. I'd have crushed the Persian Empire. Darius. If Philip had invaded the shores of the Persian Empire in place of my son, how far would he have got? As far as the god would allow. <laughs> Darius was a god too, in the eyes of the barbarians. Oh, I don't blaspheme. It's a factual observation. The Persian king was a god. Is that not so? <laughs> A divine war. The Greek god against the Persian god. What do you say about that? <laughs> Perhaps there is a little of the gods in every great man. It worries me that Alexander ignored so many of the omens. After our libation to the gods, a toast to the conquest of Arabia. Alexander had a fever, just like Hephaestion's a few months before. It has been suggested that he was poisoned, but it's not likely. More probably, he was suffering from a bout of malaria. He had a violent thirst. The days passed and he began to recover a little. Eventually, he was able to start work again on his schemes for the future. The departure for Arabia had been postponed, of course, but at least the enforced delay meant that Alexander now had time to consider affairs of state in detail. Occasionally, he had relapses, and his general recovery was slow. Often, he was too weak to leave his bedroom. Didn't stop him working. The young king had grand ideas for the future of his world, and he worked hard on them. Cities should be merged, and slaves and manpower should be exchanged between Asia and Europe in order to bring the two continents to common concord and family friendship by mixed marriages and the ties of kith and kin. Then the fever boiled up again, and this time his doctors became extremely concerned. Mm. 
Keep your voices down. What's the matter? They believe Alexander is dead, my lord. I do have heard these rumors. But rest assured, Alexander still lives. They wish to see for themselves, sir. Arrange something. The most trusted commanders were allowed into the sick room. Alexander was too weak even to talk. Alexander of Macedon, ruler of the Persian Empire, died far from his homeland at the age of 32. It was Bagoas, the Persian eunuch, who performed the most final of all services for his master. Alexander's back was the only part of his body free from scars. He had never run from the enemy in his life. The embalmed body lay in state in Babylon, guarded by the companions of honor. It was decided that the body should be returned to Greece and the complicated arrangements were put in hand for the long journey. He would be guarded by his troops every mile of the way. At last, Alexander the Great had reached the end of the world. The shock of his death was great, and there were people who refused to accept that he was really dead. Others believed his soul had simply departed to another place, and he lived on there. Soon, storytellers throughout the land were telling tales of Alexander and his achievements. Some of them were even true. Within a generation, the legends on the storyteller's lips had captured the imaginations of painters and sculptors. Alexander, it was told, had come face to face with the wild man of India and had defeated him in a terrible fight. 
Alexander had spoken with the talking tree and had learned its secrets. The Emperor of China had welcomed him and together they had watched the magic nymphs bathe in their secluded pool. Hundreds of years later, people believed that Alexander had visited the sacred city of Mecca and had prayed at the Kaaba, the great temple. Alexander, who was planning to take his armies to Arabia, had finally traveled there in legend. By the 14th century, he had become the inspiration for the Crusaders, who saw themselves following in Alexander's footsteps. Once again, he was fighting the barbarians in the east, but this time in the name of Christ. There was no end to it. It was believed he was the first man to fly, hauled into the air by griffins, straining to reach a lump of meat which he held above their greedy snouts. He plumbed the depths of the oceans in the world's first submarine with a cat and a canary for company. There was even a story that Alexander had found a tribe of headless men. Each age had its vision of Alexander. There are passages about him in the Koran. He figures in the Old Testament. He was a Renaissance hero, a figure of romance, a man of civilization. Yet perhaps we are closer to him today than anyone has been for 2,000 years. This exquisite gold object is a direct link with Alexander. He may even have gazed upon it as we do now. <laughs>